Our destination was in the Ellsworth Mountains, the highest range in Antarctica. South of Cape Horn and across the stormy Southern Ocean, we would be just 700 miles from the South Pole, well inside the Antarctic continental interior, 1,800 miles from the nearest town, on the edge of the ice cap as it flows into the glacier systems. These are the aerial photographs taken in 1962 by the US Geological Survey, USGS, and the maps that show where they took the pictures along a northwest, southeast direction, taking the pictures from left vertically and right overlapping each other, which enables us to figure out a way through these various glaciers and crevasse fields and mountains, both from the point of view of hauling sledges from A to B, and also which mountains might be climbable, and from which direction. The west side looks very steep and rocky with near vertical cliffs and steep ridges. The east side very heavily crevassed with ice and snow. So it's difficult to tell from five miles up what's uh, doable and what isn't. But we're hoping to climb a number of mountains, and uh, it looks as though Mounts Capley, Sporley, Hall, Robinson, Rogers, and Rellman are all unclimbed as far as we know, plus a whole bunch of other unnamed peaks. So we're going to try and figure out a route that enables us to get from here through climbing a few mountains on the way through to the Anderson Massif over here, which is a very remote region that's hardly ever been visited, if ever. My story starts at my boarding school in Kent. Outside my dormitory was a painting of Captain Titus Oates leaving Scott's tent in a blizzard in 1912 to a certain death in order to save his companions, saying, I may be some time. At my second boarding school, there was a painting of Dr. Edward Wilson, who had been at Cheltenham College and was Scott's number two on both the 1903 and 1911 expeditions. I admired Wilson enormously, a strong, kind personality and a brilliant scientist. At the Oates Museum, I found the cookers used and the famous photo of them at the South Pole. They were the last people to stand on the South Pole for another 44 years. They died from hypothermia, caused partly by loss of fuel at supply depots. The only way into the Antarctic interior is via a Russian cargo plane managed by Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions. Twenty years ago there was no way in except via governments on scientific expeditions, mostly on the coast, such as the British Antarctic Survey. ALE put me in touch with Simon Garrod, a former commander with the British Antarctic Survey, who would guide our expedition. Simon had led expeditions in the region close to the area we planned to visit. Simon's experience in this region was to prove invaluable. I'd been in contact with cancer backup the last few years, as my mother had died from cancer, and my wife Bonnie was battling cancer, surviving against the odds. Cancer backup were keen to raise charity donations on the back of publicizing this expedition. For training, I did a night climb on Aldoinua Lengai, the Maasai Mountain of God, an erupting volcano in East Africa. I got more than I'd bargained for, as four earthquakes went off while I was there, one starting a rock slide in the night. On top, there was a wild scene of belching steam, gases and lava flows, the reward for 6,000 punishing feet of vertical ascent. Well, here's some of the kit I'll be taking down to Antarctica. Most important thing of all is boots skis and crampons. These boots are good for minus 30, minus 40. They're designed for high altitude Himalaya or Antarctica. In the boots here, they go inside these middle boots and then there's outer boots up here with the uh, gaiters on. And they're good for climbing with crampons and also skiing. And on a steep slope, 70, 80 degrees, uh, you use the front points like here, and that's how you get up. These are wonderful boots because they work for both crampons and skis, so you don't have to change the boots from one to the other. And here's how the skis work. These same boots that were used for the crampons just slot in here, and pop that up, pops into place. You can walk on these skis, like cross country, you pop that down, and they're like downhill skis. They can. Uh, they're used on steep slopes, and they've got good side-to-side -side control. All this can be operated with a ski stick here, so just pop that to release it, and then you're back in walking mode again. It works. These are the Sorel Mukluk boots. 
very good for cold weather, North Slope Alaska or Antarctica. Extremely warm, four layer, have a look at that. And underneath we've got instep crampons. These are ideal for hard blue ice, which we expect to find on the glaciers, where they've been swept clean by catabatic winds. We'll use these where it's too hard to ski, and we want to haul the sledges on the blue ice where we need to have traction both uphill and downhill. Preparations involve collecting my gear from a previous Greenland mountaineering expedition, getting more specialized equipment, and keeping the weight to a minimum. Well, I've loaded up this backpack with water, about 35 pounds. Heading up the hill to get my heart into good shape. Workouts involve the equivalent of climbing the Eiffel Tower in 13 minutes. Dragging tires is the traditional training for polar expeditions. On November the 16th, I flew to Miami and then overnight across the equator. Well, I'm in the Southern Hemisphere now. We've made it to Santiago in Chile. Had a bit of a setback here. One of the uh, things we didn't want to happen did happen. That is, one of my three bags has not made it here. And I've got three flights to go. I've done two. I've been on the go now for 41 hours without stopping. So I'm getting pretty tired now. And the bag that didn't make it had skis, poles, uh, snow shovel, and so on in it. I did anticipate this could happen, so things that I can't get in South America, namely boots and bindings, I brought a spare set of bindings with me, and I wore the boots through the airport's big triple layer mountaineering boots, which was kind of raising some attention in Heathrow and in Miami, and all my uh, cold weather gear, so that wouldn't get lost, I wore it at the airports as well, uh, so as to keep within the one bang limit. And I was able to spend the day in Santiago, cancelled my flights down to Punta Arenas, and was able to get some not so ideal skis, but at least something that will do. And I found a mechanic that could put the bindings on, and I got some uh, instructions on how to do that in Spanish, so all these things were kind of thought through. And the trip's still on. I'm going to try and get another flight now down to Punta Arenas. Antarctica is guarded by the storms of the Southern Ocean, which sweep around incessantly, funneling through the gap south of Cape Horn. This shows the paths of the storm tracks as they encircle Antarctica. On the continent, the weather is dominated by catabatic winds, which flow down from the ice cap to the coast under their own weight, reaching up to 200 miles an hour. Patriot Hills Base Camp is in the lee of a mountain range, where the winds are strongest. This map shows the paths of the Katabatics as they flow from the center radially outwards towards the coast. I had to wait in Punta Arenas for a week on a two-hour alert as winds in Patriot Hills reached over 60 miles an hour. While waiting for the wind to drop, we heard that a cruise ship to the south of us, the MS Explorer, had been sunk by ice. Fortunately, all the passengers and crew were rescued. After many days and nights on standby, we were finally on our way in the Russian Aleutian 76. Landing at Patriot Hills is a pilot's nightmare due to strong catabatic crosswinds, downdrafts, mountains alongside the airstrip, and the blue ice, slippery as a skating rink, 
and swept clean by the catabatic winds. Well, we finally made it. We just arrived in Antarctica. And this is my home here at Patriot Hills. A, a very nice roomy tent. And it's around about minus 12, a nice sunny day here. And just coming up to eight in the evening. And uh, the plane just left. It won't be back here for another week. And uh, it's just great to be here. Lovely, quiet spot. Beautiful mountains. And all these years, finally made it. The midnight sun traveled horizontally high in the sky. Our last flight was in a ski-equipped twin otter. Our sledges were alarmingly heavy at about 80 kilograms or 180 pounds each. Okay, south, 79 degrees, 39 minutes. West, 083 degrees, 22 minutes. Thank you. We flew along the edge of the ice cap, past pyramid-shaped peaks, past huge wind scoops, and wide glaciers. Ahead was the region we were going to travel, to the right side completely unexplored, and in the distance the Vincent Massif, over 120 miles away. landed on an unnamed glacier, which I called Garrod Glacier, unexplored. We were the first to step foot on it. And then the Twin Otter was off, leaving us on our own, as the sun swooped down to the south for its all-night circle across the sky. Now the back-breaking work of hauling sledges began. The slope started out as a 10 degree incline, then steepened, forcing us to zigzag. This felt like being a cart horse. I could understand how so many polar adventurers gave up under the mental pressure. My heart raced, my legs ached, my head pounded. 
I went for 100 steps at a time, then to 200, then 300, then a one minute rest. Soft powder on a hard pack slowed our pace. This was what burned up calories at up to 10,000 per day, three times normal daily levels. Okay, this is our restaurant here. What do we got for... Uh, what have we got for dinner? To eat, for, to eat tonight. Bit of snow. Bit of snow, yeah. Bit of ice. A bit of snow and ice because we're so hard. Uh, we're really roughing it. We've got some uh, pre-made from Patriot Hills uh, spaghetti, well, bolognese sauce. Frozen food, so we're just in the right continent for frozen food. Ahead there was a pass and crevasses either side. We roped up, left our sledges behind and explored unknown territory, skiing with just our climbing gear, crevasse rescue gear and packs. The snow got harder, cut with sastrugi. Uh, it's quite chilly, uh, right in the cold here, the wind's whistling by. We just turned back from this pass up to the right here. We went up this uh, glacier valley, which probably has never been visited before. Looking for a route over the pass the other side. And uh, it was blowing very hard there, probably minus maybe 18, minus 20 at the top. And very strong wind. Cut up with Sastrugi. We left the packs behind to do a reconnoiter and the view from there was phenomenal uh, looking down over the Rutford ice stream which goes out onto the ice shelf and then the other way looking down onto the ice cap so we were quite high up on the pass and uh, it was blowing hard and it was heavily crevassed ahead of us uh, on the routes we wanted to take up to the, uh, the west so those weren't feasible so we came back here to the uh, camp I called the pass Disappointment Pass. Next day we skied west for our first climb. But I reckon it's about minus 15 still. Uh, and we're just taking our skis off. It's starting to get near the coal here, so lots of sastrugi and very hard, not very nice for skiing. And I was a bit worried it might be one or two slots on the way up, so I wanted to keep the skis on. And uh, then we're going to stick our crampons on and go up this peak that's in front of us. So we'll probably go up to the right of the spur of rock that's coming down, trying to find the easiest way up without it being too steep. You can see on the left of it there's obviously a, a Bergschrundy thing, so we don't want to go left particularly. We took photos of the cancer backup banner to show our support. We've got a great little glide here. Peak two now, and it was quite a steep snow climb. Bit of front pointing, 
and we've got a cliff down the other side here, rocky cliff. So we're kind of tied off around the top of this little summit here. And we can see Mount Vincent, which must be, what, 100 miles away or so? As we could not get through the pass, we had no option but to go back down Garrett Glacier, losing our hard-won altitude. Simon commented that man-hauling was more efficient than dog teams, aeroplanes, or snowcats, and that hardened criminals could be used to haul supplies across Antarctica with minimal environmental impact and low carbon footprint. However, we acknowledged that human rights groups would shut it down as a cruel and inhuman punishment. There were some large crevasses around 20 feet wide and 500 feet long. We kept well clear of them. Well, we had a hard day today. Went down the bottom of the glacier towards Union Glacier and up this glacier, which is Driscoll Glacier. Climbed about 200 meters, holding the pulks. And now we're in a beautiful spot, surrounded by icy mountains. And there's some high cloud coming in, and we're expecting some bad weather. So we might be stuck here a day or so tomorrow, because we're not going to move if the weather's bad. It's too dangerous. So we're all camped in here with uh, tents dug in, snow around the tents to weight down the edges of the tent so it doesn't get uh, blown away in a blizzard. And we've got the pulks tied down to snow sticks so they won't blow away either. And we'll just see what the morrow brings. Simon was kitted up for a cold day, looking like Darth Vader. Okay, we're at the uh, high point of our trip, 1,865 meters on an unnamed peak, almost certainly unclimbed. Now over there is Mount Spawley, which we decided was just a little bit uh, too risky to attempt. But oh, we've had a change in the weather, it's still around minus 20, but there's a stiff breeze now, maybe 10-15 knots, that's enough to knock it down to. straight from the south to New Caledonia. Behind me there's a weather system now which is closing up. And um, some uh, cloud dropping down lower on the hill. So we may have a little night on this. It's been a very cold and windy night. Winds dropped now, thank goodness. But the tent was being sandblasted by ice crystals a lot of the night. Not much sleep.
spell of good weather had come to an end, and a north wind blew mist up the glacier ahead of us. The sky became overcast, and lenticular clouds warned us of high wind ahead. This bad weather could cause three problems. First, blizzard conditions confining us to our tents. Secondly, whiteouts making it impossible to see and dangerous to travel. And thirdly, the impossibility of a plane pickup, possibly for ten days or more. Our breath froze to our faces in the headwind against us. clear hours allowed us to attempt Roger's Peak. climbed hard, brittle ice above a deep wind scoop, then encountered a crevasse field crossing fragile bridges that could collapse without warning. This was a dangerous area. Simon tried another route, but the crevasses were 20 feet wide and covered over with weak bridges. We had to retreat. We found another way up, through a rocky gully up onto an icy valley at the top. We encountered an ice cliff 200 feet high, which we had not seen on the aerial photos. We skirted around the back of it, climbed above it, and above a bergschrund. This was a hazardous area, and the ice was so hard it was difficult to get a crampon to grip, and too brittle to put in the ice screws for protection. We decided to retreat just 150 meters below the summit, due to the risk of sliding over the top of the ice cliff in a 500 foot free fall. But how to protect our crossing of the bergschrund? The ice was too hard and brittle for snow stakes or ice screws. Simon found a thin crevasse and jammed in his ice axe for a belay. The weather started closing in again, and there was a risk of being stranded for one or two weeks in a remote, exposed area. So, as the storm clouds rolled in from the west, we called the Twin Otter in. So we headed back to Patriot Hills. Here's where we went. First, up Garrard Glacier to Camps 1 and 2, Disappointment Pass and Peaks 1 and 2, then down Garrard Glacier, then a very long slog up Driscoll Glacier to Camp 3, then to Camps 4 and 5, a climb to Peak 3 and back to Camp 5, then 18 kilometers downhill to Camp 6 and Rogers Peak, over 100 kilometers with 8,700 feet of vertical gain climbed. Ronnie Fences, a cook at Patriot Hills, taught me how to kite ski, which was great fun, bouncing along over the Sastrugi. Ronnie later broke the record, kiting back from the South Pole to the coast in an amazing five days. It normally takes 60 days by manhole. He also broke the world record 24-hour run by clocking 502 kilometers in one day. But a major storm system swept over Ellsworth Mountains and closed in Patriot Hills for nine days. It was 2,500 miles across and brought in east winds with heavy snow and continuous whiteout with no sun night or day. 
Well, I've always wanted to go inside an igloo. So let's go inside this one and find out what it's like. Then the blizzard descended. No planes could fly for 11 days. During the whiteouts, no one could leave camp. There were 35 of us, a sort of polar version of Big Brother. We had 97 days of food in the ice cave, a system of tunnels dug out with chainsaws. Inside the cook tent, snow is melted for food and drink. Work continued whenever possible, but the planes were tied down with jackets tied over their engines to keep the snow out. This was my home for 11 days while the storm blew over. An excellent clamshell tent, originally an Ernest Shackleton design, strongly built, tied down with anchors drilled into the snow, with blocks of snow cut by chainsaw and weighing down the edges. Inside was well below freezing, but safe and out of the wind, although plenty of snow on the floor. And we had a volleyball tournament with plenty of bruises from the hard ball, stiff in the sub-zero temperatures. At the end of nine days, there was two feet of soft powder, unusual in this desert climate. The problem now was how to clear this off the blue ice runway, as the wind had dropped. Then the catabatic wind came back, helping blow the runway clear, and the Aleutian 76 came back. And we were on our way back to Punta Arenas and civilization, the end of an amazing journey to an amazing place. <laughs>